Thanks, right everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, happy Friday of Brick City weekend here on campus. Um, it is our distinct pleasure to have these four alumni with us from the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences. I'm Lisa Vassatoro, Director of Alumni Relations for the awesome College of Art and Design. Um, my partner in, in uh, this endeavor is William Snyder, who is uh, on this call as well. Um, thanks everybody. We will, I would have you post questions in chat and we'll take questions towards the end here. We're gonna have each presenter go for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and with that, we our lead will be uh, Deborah Rothenberg. Thanks so much, Deborah. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Deborah Rothenberg. I live in New York City. I've been here since 1999, and I graduated from RIT, the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences, in May of 1984. And on that September 11th morning. I was living on 10th and University Place down in Greenwich Village, and I was about a month away from being married. Um, and my husband is a pilot and a photographer. And I remember saying to him, we were lying in bed, actually, because we, we work all crazy hours, and our apartment literally shook. And I said to him, oh my God, did you hear that plane? Because it was so low and we, and we felt it. And he said, that he goes, there's something wrong. That's not the normal flight pattern. And then all of a sudden he said, oh my God, it crashed. And I said, how did you know? And he said, I heard a boom. And right at that point, our phone started ringing and it, people saying, is Philip flying today? A plane just hit the World Trade Center. And at this point, we didn't know if it was a small plane, a big plane. And I said, no, he's right here with me. And the phone kept ringing. And we got down from our loft, turned on the TV, saw what was going on and was scurrying to get our camera equipment ready and ran upstairs to the roof. And uh, I think I was on overdrive that day. I really, it's amazing the things that I remember and what I don't remember. And I just remember at one point seeing the second plane going toward the tower and hitting it and just pointing and saying, oh my God, look at that plane. And then it disappeared, but it didn't register what happened. And at this point, Philip went to get his camera equipment and my brother Craig knocked on my door and he happened to be, I believe he was at the World Trade Center or in that area for his job. He had a meeting then. So we called, before the phones went dead, we called everybody that we knew. I called my father. I called my oldest brother, Randy, who was also living here in New York City to make sure he was okay, let him know we were okay. Uh, my friend Greg from out in Wisconsin sent me an email asking if I was okay. And this was when we still had dial up. So I got an email back to him, we're fine, everything's okay. And everything went dead. I went back to the roof where these pictures were taken and there was a woman on the roof from my building huddled in the corner on the phone with her mother. And all I kept hearing her say was she was crying and she said, mommy, mommy, I'm so scared. And she must have been in her 30s. And at that point, that's when my phone went dead. Everyone else's phone went dead. Um, this was literally the, the first tower exploding. Um, and then Philip and I went down to the site that day. And I got to, early on, we went down there. And I got as far as Church Place, which is kind of... Deborah, uh, Church, Deborah it's kind please, of close. Yeah. Deborah. I'm sorry? Excuse yeah. me, sorry, we're not seeing your photos. Let's try your screen share again. Okay, hold on. Apologies, everyone. We thought we had this, huh? Tell, tell me when, I'll, I'll put them up. Tell me if you could, yep. could you see this one? Nope, I'm seeing just your name. Okay, hold on, everybody. Um. There we go. Could you there see that? There you go. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So this was taken from my roof again on 10th and University Place, which I think is maybe a mile and a half at most from the World Trade Center site. This was also taken from my roof. Now we had a clear view of the World Trade Center 
from both University Place and one block to the west, which was Fifth Avenue, as well as my roof. This was from the roof, uh, literally, as you could see, when it, the first tower was exploding. And it was early on after the two towers exploded that we went down, we started heading down to the site and there was just too much dust and too much debris that I, I said I couldn't breathe, so we turned back. I went, we both went down there later on and then the following morning and I was a freelancer for the New York Daily News at the time. And I was down there, I think it was the next day on the 12th and I got a call. Um, actually, it wasn't on my cell phone. We had pagers that you could communicate with at that time. And my editor said, do you have any pictures? First, he asked me where I was. And I said, I'm at ground zero. And he said, I need pictures of tired firemen. And I said, okay, when? And he said, now. So I ran around taking more pictures and I didn't know how I was gonna get up to 33rd and 9th Avenue where the Daily News was at that point. And Philip asked, is there anybody here that could take her up to the Daily News? And there was this one cop that said, where, where are they? And we told them where, and we were, I think we were going about a hundred miles an hour up Sixth Avenue and there was not a single person out on, nobody was out. Um, this was obviously, you know, uh, we saw firemen and other people helping with whatever they could help with. Uh, we went down there also trying to see if we could help if there was anything that anybody needed and there was nothing. There was no, you know, trying to help people, seeing if we could give blood, what could we do? And you just didn't see anybody except first responders out there. And this picture was, somebody actually put this on a, a holiday ornament. It ran in the daily news and the woman found me online and contacted me. And we were wondering for years actually who he was. And I was really wondering who he was. And several years after 9-11, I was actually online at a bank and I turned around and he looked really familiar. And I asked him if he was a, if he was a fireman and he said he was and, and I sent him this picture. I told him that I took a picture of him that day. So that was just, I still think it's kind of amazing that years later, you find somebody that you photographed on such a tragic day. And that's it, that's all my pictures. Uh, oh, the, um, we got married five weeks later and we went to Greece on our honeymoon and we were glued to the TV. And when we came back, our neighborhood, I think it was a good three, four months that it still smelled. Every day you could just, you could smell the, it was like electrical and then just weird smells. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. With that, we'll uh, pass the uh, baton to Eris. Okay, am I sharing it now? Yeah. Nope, not yet. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. There you go. Yep, great. Thank you. Okay, um, that day started for me um, at 8.22 in the morning. I'm 30 years old. I'm a staff photographer at the Star Ledger newspaper based in Newark, New Jersey. And I had not even been in the New York City area uh, for a year. Um, I was living in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, literally just right behind the Statue of Liberty. Uh, my condo, um, my backyard was a canal and there was a ferry right from my condo building going into Manhattan. And uh, I'm a 1994 graduate of the School of Photographic Arts um, and their photojournalism program. And uh, so that day started at 822 in the morning. And what happened was my mom called me. I wasn't supposed to work till three o'clock that day. And it was a trivial conversation. And I was kind of pissed off because 
I was hung over. I didn't have to work till three o'clock that day. And, you know, we got off the phone and I wanted to sleep back, you know, I wanted to sleep in, uh, not working till three. And then a half hour later, I get a phone call from my editor playing in the tower and I run and uh, I bring two cameras, one a Nikon, one a Canon, one digital, one film. Uh, both my digital cameras for work were busted and I had just one loner. So I'm glad I brought film. And on the ferry, I saw I was able to line up the Statue of Liberty and the Burning Towers. And uh, I was actually running to the ferry when the second plane hit and uh, I didn't see it. And um, I didn't really know what to think. Uh, I thought it was a Cessna. I didn't know it was a terrorist attack. Uh, my job is to document what's happening. And the ferry went to Pier 11, which is on the in lower Manhattan on the east side, on the East River there. And I'd never even been in lower Manhattan ever before either, or to the Trade Center. So I just went, you know, followed the smoke and the towers. And uh, this is on Broadway. And uh, everybody was just in awe. This is two blocks away from the towers. And uh, originally I wanted to go closer um, and there's a park down there and it's now called Zuccotti Park. Now it's, that's where they had um, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, at the time I wasn't called that, but a police officer didn't allow me to go closer and probably saved my life. Uh, so now I'm on Broadway and you can actually tell it's 945 according to this guy's watch. By 1030, everything had fallen. So... Uh, I'm photographing on Broadway and first responders are taking care of people, uh, giving aid and I'm giving them their space, but I want to photograph what's happening. And then all of a sudden I hear this metallic groaning sound and the ground just starts shaking. I'm literally a block away from the towers right now. Um, and uh, the towers, the, the South Tower fell and everybody ran, looked for shelter and uh, I went down into a lobby, uh, excuse me, a flight of stairs trying to go into the train, into the, the train station, but the, the subway, but everything was closed. Um, I, I come back out and, um, you know, uh, I, I found a lobby of a building and I have that picture also, which I'll show. And you're there to document what's happening and it's total chaos. Um, and I came back and this is what I saw. And these were some of the first firefighters on scene. It's like, where do you start? Where do you begin? And uh, that day was a 70 degree, sunny, clear day. And depending on the smoke, it could be uh, very dark or it could be completely bright that day. Um, this police officer uh, was injured. He was in the path station underneath the towers. And uh, this guy was a big, big, you know, six foot six guy. And he was rattled and uh, found out he broke nose, some ribs. And uh, the only thing that he could say is, this is war, this is war. And he kept on saying that. And the dust literally covered everything. And um, you know, I wear contacts and they start bothering my eyes. And uh, I, one of my, my right eye, the contact fell out. It was so dry. So I actually took my left contact and put it in my right eye. And uh, just so I could see. Um, and we take for granted, um, you know, people working down there. And this was a fruit cart. And um you know, where did this seller go? You know, you just take for granted. And I I've, remember taking this photograph and thinking of Pompeii, you know, the dust. So I'm photographing and uh, now this is on Broadway again after one of the towers had fallen and, uh, you know, regrouping. And uh, it's a lot, uh, the air is, you know, dusty in this bank. It's a Chase Manhattan bank. And the people kept on coming to me. Are you all right? You're right. I'm like, I'm fine. And I just focused on my job. And this gentleman is using a prayer shot to breathe through. Um, 
you know, the first tower fell and then there was a time between and then the second tower fell. And in hindsight, not the smartest thing to do, though, but I actually went closer in between after the first one fell. I had to see what happened. And, um, you know, it was just this bizarre uh, apocalyptic scene. So uh, this picture is actually after the first tower fell. And I told you I went down the subway and it was closed. So I go up and this is on John Street. Um, right off Broadway. And I go into this lobby. Now this lobby is really dusty, but it's not like outside. Outside you can barely see or and also breathe at the time. So I hear these voices and you're a photojournalist, but most importantly, you're a human being first. And I heard voices and I told people, come to my voice, come for shelter and safety. And about a half a dozen people came into this lobby at 2 John Street. And uh, there was a paramedic from this Orthodox Jewish paramedic group, and he starts doing his job. And I start doing my job. I'm cleaning off my lenses and I start taking photographs. And he only says this to me. He takes his yarmulke off and he uses it as a filter as he's breathing through it. And he only says this to me. He says, see, yarmulkes do come in handy. And at a time which I wasn't feeling anything, he brought a smile. He's making jokes. And that's just so important because humor can help ground you in humanity too. And this photograph, um, uh, the, the, the lady in front, I still do not know who she is. I know the other people in the picture, but she's screaming, oh my God, we're alive, we're alive. Oh my God, we're alive. And uh, this is on 800 uh, speed film. And all I'm thinking of is 15th of a second shutter, hold your hand study. And of course, I'm feeling that, though, but um, it, it's literally it, it's like a switch. You you focus on your job and what you have to do and you turn your emotions off the challenges and that what PTSD is, is switching that back to reality. And this lady asked me, why are you taking pictures? And I'm like, oh, crap. And now I have to think. Um, and I responded. I said, we have to remember this. We can't forget. And after I said that, nobody questioned me there. Uh, so this is in the bank lobby um, uh, at Chase Mahan Bank. And the, the story about 9-11 was not the towers. The towers can be replaced. It's about what happened to the people that day. And this woman had asthma and it was very hard for her to breathe. And I have pictures of the towers, you know, and with the smoke and everything like that. But the strongest pictures are about the relationships and the people of the caring. Um, that day we saw the best in humanity, but also the worst. Now, this is both towers had fallen and uh, they actually put up a police line and uh, working in New York City, you see a police line, you don't pass. it. You got to be respectful of that. And guess what? There was plenty of pictures to take. But also it was really dangerous. That, that metal was sharp, it was hot. And you kept on hearing like little explosions. I don't know if a gas tank or whatever it was though, but all these pictures are photographed from the east of the towers along uh, Church Street, which is the street that the towers were on and Broadway. And I felt safe and there was plenty of pictures to be taken there. And uh, yeah, these two guys to the left, just a sense of the scale of the wreckage and the size. And then it was a sunny day and uh, it was uh, pretty crazy in that sense. And the, the wind and the smoke constantly moved. Um, and uh, here are the guys searching for survivors. And this is, all these pictures were in the first three hours. Um, I was, uh, severely injured. Uh, my eyes uh, corrected uh, was 2100. So I was legally blind by the end of the day with all the debris and everything like that. Uh, I partially lost the first layer of my cornea in my right eye and scratched up my left eye. And then also I had microscopic shards of glass embedded in my eyelids. So when I blinked, it irritated my eyes also. Uh, the good news is that eyes actually heal rather quickly. And uh, I was back at work a month and a half later. Um, PTSD is a whole nother thing. And um, 
it actually gets harder later on, I feel like. But uh, uh, this firefighter, this is right on Church Street, and he's all bummed out. He can't find his buddies. And like I said before, things we just take for granted, you know, being able to get your coffee on uh, Church Street. This is right near Wall Street. And, uh, you know, what happened to the guy working there? So this is John Street. And um, by 1230, I was pretty much by one o'clock, I was back in New Jersey. So uh, I was low on film and uh, digital also and physically just not in a good state. And uh, so I had to walk back to um, the ferry. And uh, uh, while there, I bumped into a couple of photographers and there's a guy, Don Halsey, who was a photographer of the New York Post. Uh, sadly, he's passed away since, but um, I'm shooting film and digital and I shoot a lot just by nature. And I only brought eight rolls of film with me and I asked him, hey, can you spare a roll? And he gave me, I didn't know at the time, one of his last two roles he had. And he told me, shoot smart, be very, very critical, you know? And uh, I thought it was just amazing. And so these three uh, office workers are leaving, walking down with me and they're very walking very slow, they're elderly. And um, as journalists, we like to get people's names while running, I lost my notepad and that was my least concern, but they were walking so slow. I picked up a piece of paper on the ground and I remember, uh, unfortunately, I didn't keep it though, but it was an American Express uh, memo of an architectural di diagram on it. And I wrote their name and I was able to ID people. Um, there was two pictures of taking me that day and it's weird when it's a photograph of you, but I'm really glad that they are because this is history. And uh, so I'm in the bank lobby and people come up to me. Are you okay? You're okay. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. But they convinced me and I went to wash off in the bathroom and remember turning on the water. It was all dirty. I was like, you, and then it cleared up and I cupped my hands and then I looked in the mirror and I was just shocked. And I dropped the water and this is before selfies. I took a self-portrait and this picture for a while really did bother me um, because why do I have this like weird ass smile? And after talking to family, friends and therapists, uh, two reasons. I looked fucking weird. I really did. Uh, I'm wearing a green shirt and, you know, I'm completely white and um also, I'm smiling because I just outran a 110-story building. And the last picture I'm going to show is not my photograph. It's a photograph of me. And it's taken by a photographer named Joe Tabaka, and, uh, who was a freelance photographer in New York City. And uh, I'm photographing right in front of uh, the towers on Church Street. And I hear this metallic groaning sound. And I look up and I see it just start to splinter like 30 yards across from me. And I just turn and start running as fast as I can up Church Street. And I see a guy with a camera. I'm not thinking, run, run. And this is picture of Joe's. This is Joe's photo of me running up Church Street. And that's the tower falling in the background. And uh, right near Joe was a, like a Greyhound bus, one of those big buses. And Joe and I dove by the bus. And that saved our life because all the debris like smushed the bus in half and then we crawled out and uh we're alive today so that's thank me. you thank you so much uh, we'll move to dan low please yeah um am i still sharing or i don't know how to yeah yeah you're sure yeah. um Eris, go to the bottom of your screen where it says share screen, click on it, the green thing. I can, uh, I can click mine and it'll eliminate his. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Oh, oh, you're all panelists. There we go. There you go, Dan. Okay. How are you doing? How are you doing? Okay. My name is Dan Lowe. I am a 1995 RIT grad of the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences at the time. Um, and uh, it was in the photojournalism program. And so back in, uh, back in 2001, uh, September 11th, I was uh, a staff photographer at the, um, at the Associated Press in Philadelphia. So I wasn't, can you see my screen, by the way? Am, am I, um, is my screen visible? Yes, Dan, okay. we can yes. see it. Okay, yes. so I was, um, I wasn't in New York at the time and I wasn't, you know, I was several hours away. So all of my photos were after the fact um, of, of, you know, this horrific uh, time period here. So, you know, we're in the bureau, um, it's a, uh, you know, just a regular, regular day. And they, um, you know, the, 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 the news reports are coming in, a plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. And um, so we're not certain what it is. It, it's a, it's a, is it an accident? Is it a, an attack of some sort? We don't know. So I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting still in Philadelphia. I'm you know, I'm sent out, I'm making pictures on our streets of, of Philly and just seeing if there's any kind of connection because we don't know uh, how widespread this is. But by uh, later that, later, very shortly after I was sent to New York, uh, New Jersey actually, to cover the Newark airport. This is after some of the reports are coming in that um, flight 93 and, uh, oh, can you see the, um, you can't see, oh. Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to. You can you can only see the grid, right? There. Yeah, I'm trying to, yep. yeah, I'm trying to. Darn, I was, I'm, let me see this. Is that better or no? It's still the, the grid, right? Still the grid, yep. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm at a loss here because. Uh, Dan? Yeah. Stop, stop sharing. Okay. And then yeah. when you go back to share, share your entire screen, your home screen. Okay. Okay. And then, then go and, and set it up for a slideshow. Okay. Let me stop the share. Okay. Let me reshare. Okay. Um, now set. Yeah. Now set no. up your, your slideshow. Select all and Can start you, your slideshow. Are you seeing it now or? Yep, yes. You're good now. Yep. Okay. So these are the, I arrived on the scene. These are, I'm, I'm in New Jersey. They're, they're, I'm at the airport mostly covering press conferences and stranded passengers. But um, when, that, when that's over, I venture over to the, to the, um, to the coastline, the coastline area visible of Manhattan from what I'm seeing at that point. Um, Again, like Eris, I'm not really, uh, you know, experienced in that in that area of, of it's not my area of coverage, um, so I wasn't sure. So I'm a lot, I'm just wind, you know, driving through to, to as close as I can get and getting scenes from from kind of afar. So I, I come across uh, Ground Zero. All of Eris's and um, Deborah's photos were quite close and up close and personal, but mine were uh, definitely uh, with the long lens across the, uh, across the river. But this one was a little bit um, eerie where you could kind of still see the, uh, the towers, the smokes of each individual tower there and um, of the towers. And it, it's, uh, you know, it was quite, uh, quite um, 
sad to see, you know, in the New York skyline, which we were all accustomed to seeing the, uh, the uh, World Trade Center towers. So uh, day, daylight comes uh, the next day. I'm, I'm back there. On the left side of the screen is ground zero. And so I'm getting more pictures of, you know, everything I'm getting without uh, going into Manhattan at all, because we had uh, at the AP, we had many photographers already in the city. So I was doing my, um, my part from the outside areas. So this is what I'm seeing with, uh, with the long lens. And then I'm told a couple days later that flights are resuming. So you can see, air, uh, you know, so I'm getting the airline flights back in, back in the air. And at the right of this side, you can see ground zero there. Bottom of the, bottom of the picture is ground zero. Airlines have resumed. Um, same thing here. And then uh, this is a, a, a week after exactly the 9-11 uh, um, at the at the morning of the um the, the one week following the the attacks and i'm getting uh passengers resuming back uh heading back into the city a lot of wall street a lot of the financial district everything shut down for for a number of days it's i'm trying to remember how long it was that they were um, shut down but it wasn't until um it wasn't until like at least a week later that they started to resume going back in and this, this picture didn't quite work, but I was told to go cover the clockwork in, in the Jersey Park, uh, Jersey City, because it actually shows the time of the tower, um, the tower getting hit and uh, one week later. And you can see after a whole week, it's still, uh, it's still pretty uh, devastated there. And then this is the second tower and some memorial stuff. So this picture is the one that kind of stood out from the, the bunch. And uh, I, at the time of shooting it, I, I really didn't think anything of it other than, uh, you know, a reflection of, you know, something tragic that happened. But I've, I've seen it, uh, you know, I've seen it over the, over 20 years now it, it lives on because it, it's a significant um, historical um, event that happened, but it continuous, I see it uh, played over and over and over and over. So it, it's not, you know, I keep, I keep questioning the photo itself of what it is, but um, people, uh, different news, news publications continue to use it overseas, local, and uh, a strange one, a strange one of this uh, significant picture here that, and this is CNN did something on it this year. Um, they contacted me, I gave them some thoughts on it, but this is where it gets a little bit kind of surreal for me because it's credited here now to Netflix. So I think they got a hold of the photo and I opened my Netflix and there it was as their cover photo for um, their uh, documentary Turning Point. And there it is there. So that was a little surreal to see that, um, how it's used continuously. So I'm gonna stop the share here. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Mine was a little bit more of a cleanse version of what um, what the last two participants that we saw, but um, nevertheless, it was uh, definitely um, definitely different on a personal level because I've been profiled several times since then. Uh, at the airport, I was profiled and um, questioned, and then later. Back in Philadelphia, I, I've never been profiled on the street, but there were like police calling that there's a uh, darker complected person taking pictures here. And this is all 2001. So 
I've I've had um, I've had some uh, unfortunate experiences being profiled, which I've never had before this event. So, sort of 9/11 changed that for me in in terms of how I um, how I'm viewed from the outside of the world, and I'm not even uh, I'm Asian, so that was also a, a peculiar uh, peculiar thing. But I guess from a distance, you can't tell. Um, and I'm looking suspicious and that's, and literally the world changed for, um, for the past 20 years for photojournalists and photographers. So, um, that's basically my, uh, what I have to add to this contribution. Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. Uh, Gary. Right. Oh wait, hold on, I gotta get back to my main screen. That was the wrong one, hold on. Uh, how do I play this? It's not going to my main page. What are you trying to do, Gary? I'm trying to get to my PowerPoint, but it's only going to this one screen. Um, oh, here we go. I got it. I got it. It's down here. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So um, this is my presentation. My name is Gary L. And I'm an RIT biomed alum, 1994. And during 9-11, I was actually uh, directing the Visual Information Services Center at McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. And at the time I was working as an air crew certified photojournalist with a team of uh, um, you know, very proficient photojournalists, many of which were RIT alum. So this is gonna be the government perspective. And um, a lot of my images were classified and never released, but the images that I'm gonna to show today were the ones that were cleared and released and scanned back in those days following 9-11. So I put this up here. I mean, back in 2001, we had some real crappy cameras. And, uh, you know, this is a DCS 620. I, I jumped in the helicopter and I grabbed two cameras. I grabbed the DCS 620. And fortunately, I grabbed an F5 that had film in it. Well, this gives you a background. Um, McGuire um, was a defense visual information service center. And uh, we provided the search and rescue teams, the medical supplies being airlifted. And we became the staging center for basically all of the search and rescue operations by FEMA. And uh, this was a hard image to, to shoot. I mean, we're going 200 miles an hour and you can't even see through your eyes when you're going that fast. And I had to get the shot. We had just flown over the Verrazano and I knew we were approaching. So I stuck my head out the window. I couldn't see a freaking thing. So I take my camera strap and I wrapped it around my elbow and then I just kind of put my elbow out the window and just fired off as many frames as I could. And then I passed the camera back and then I grabbed the film camera and shot as many frames as I could with the film camera. And you'll see that here in this next shot. You can see it's much clearer on the, the good old film. <laughs> so the base also provided a combat support hospital, Tent City. Uh, we really thought we were gonna have lots of evacuees. So we established the Surgeon General came down, we set up these big tent cities and it very quietly went away, like on September 13th. But um, we were working for NORAD, NORAD had replaced the Air Force and, and, and FEMA was putting in requests. And then we had, you know, President Bush stuff we had to cover. And um, the guy who's flying this helicopter right here, he was Lieutenant Colonel Brad Webb. He's now, General Brad Webb. And it's this guy right here from this famous photo that everybody is aware of from the Situation Room during the Bin Laden raid. So um, on this day, he was plotting revenge, man. And if you, if you could hear what was going on in the radio communications between the choppers, I mean, they were gonna get Bin Laden.
So due to the limitations of the civilian helicopters, the FEMA needed to get the shots. We needed to see what was going on so we could provide the firefighting support to the areas that really needed to, you know, to, to be looked upon. And there were no photos. I mean, they needed somebody up in the sky to get aerial shots. And due to that close proximity to New York City, I jumped on this special ops MH-53 and we zoomed up there and I provided all these aerial shots. And uh, of course I'm smiling there too because it was quite the thrill landing on the USS Intrepid. We were just up there doing the big shot for all you older RIT photo alums. Like the previous year, we're on the Intrepid doing the big shot. So I went back, you know, during this whole, you know, awful event. So coming back that day, it was, man, talking about PTSD, I mean, the, the smoke and the smell, I mean, you're in such a low, it's like, oh my God, I mean, how can this happen? I mean, what happened? I mean, what the heck was going on? And, and my head was in, in my lap and I was just looking down, you know, just, you know, devastated. And I looked up just for a second, just for a quick second. And these guys are Air Force guys, you know, they're, they're young kids, they, they buzzed the Statue of Liberty. And all I could see was just her face. And it was like a microsecond, her face, her eyes and her smile just filled that window. And it just, it totally froze forever in my mind. And it was such a split second that I don't think, I don't think anybody saw it. I mean, there are only two of us in the back of the chopper. So I, I guess I would be the only, only person to see it. But um, it gave me that hope that I needed that, you know what? I think we're gonna be okay. We're gonna survive this. I mean, the Statue of Liberty is still there. She's the symbol of liberty. And, and if she's still standing, well, by golly, I can stand tall and I can do my job too. So uh, we would spend, we would go back and forth to Ground Zero countless times right up to September 29th. And I haven't been back and I have no intentions of ever, ever, ever going back. Um, on just one day, 14 September, we covered President Bush visit, we were doing the combat air patrols. We were flying F-16s and F-15s all over Manhattan. And we were doing the aerial refueling directly over <laughs> midtown Manhattan, which was just, just crazy. This was uh, one of the last days of search and recovery. And then it just became a, a cleanup. And, you know, the, the scene was so massive. It's like, you know, to, to find one thing to zoom in on and, and try to make your focal point was really, really difficult. And this guy was just juxtaposed against that blue smoke and he just really stood out. And this next shot, I zoom out a little bit wider so you can see kind of more of the scene. I mean, you can see him here. I mean, this is just, it was like Star Wars, man. Like these things were just digging and the smoke and the firefighters and, and the smell and uh, it was just, man, it was something nobody should ever experience. This was uh, Fire Marshal Frank Quillis. He was actually in the Air National Guard, so we went up there finding him for DOD. They wanted to, to uh, do a feature on this guy since he was uh, an active DOD guy. Um, our entire team, like I mentioned before, there were several RIT alums that were there. And I wanted to, to plug Scott Spitzer, who was also Biomed 99. And down at Dover, we had folks down there, John Sidoriak and Bill Plate, and they were supporting some of the Pentagon imagery. And um, I had Jared Needle that came down from the, the Groton nuclear sub base because we couldn't get any, we, I mean, we couldn't get combat camera, we couldn't get any military photographers, but I knew that I could get Jared Needle since he was, you know, within our, our department so he came down to help us out um, over the years we had um, several interns and various people that supported us at DOD including Eric Kunzman, Denise Gould and Steve so this is uh, some of the shots this is me here Scott Spitzer Ken Mann he was not an RIT guy and a couple of our DOD public affairs folks um, this are some of the FEMA guys transition and that Scott captured. And uh, Scott was covering Bush while I was actually um, already at ground zero. Okay, I wanted to leave you with this one here. I don't, I don't go back to look at my images and I haven't looked at anything except for the stuff that I scanned back in September, 2001. 
And I have a lot of images. I have thousands of images, but man, I, I can't look at them. But this one I looked at, I, I looked at it again a couple of years ago. And it was like 18 years after I saw this image that was kind of wiped into them. This is black marble. And I'm like, oh my God, what is that? I could see horns. I could see an ear. I could see this evil brow and nose. And then it looked like a Roman, like the devil kissing a Roman. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see a freaking airplane. I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, are you kidding me? It took me 18 years to see this image. Unreal. So I kind of outlined it here to give you a, an idea of, I mean, that's just crazy symbolism. And then we went on to, um, this is the, I, I mentioned this before, this is the combat air patrols. I mean, these are loaded F-15s, I mean, fully armed, flying over Manhattan. <laughs> I mean, it was just insane. And then uh, these were the first troops to come back from Operation Enduring Freedom. So um, we, we covered it quite extensively, going right into the war aspect of it, into 2002. So that's all I have. Thank you, Gary, and thanks everybody. I um, I don't know. I I feel like we've asked so much of you to present these images and to talk with us about this, and to you know, I can only imagine um, what it conjures up. It, as our dean Todd Jokel indicated so beautiful that yet so painful. Um, again, I, I can't even begin to imagine. We've asked um, if folks have questions to go ahead and, and post those in the chat. Um, I'll lead off with one. Is there a, a point in time where you, you know, I recall not having any idea what was happening. I initially thought it was a terrible, horrible accident. And then you quickly realized that likely it was not. And I remember not having any idea what to tell my very young children, et cetera, et cetera. And I just kind of, I felt like we were in a holding pattern. At what point did each of you realize this was actually an act of terrorism? I, I Go ahead, think, Dan. You yeah. know, working for a news organization, especially, a, a, you know, a larger, you know, large one that's covering all the bases. Um, you know, when there's an additional plane crashes going on, then you're like, okay, this is not, um, this is not a coincidence. You know, there's something else going on here. So it was pretty, uh, pretty quick for that, uh, for that realization. Uh, for me, um, I, I thought it was a Cessna, which hit. I didn't really know it was a terrorist attack. And um, more importantly, though, was my job was just to document what was happening. Um, I wasn't trying to think about uh, what are the ramifications if we're going to war or anything like that. Um, uh, to, more important is just be an eyewitness. Sure. Yeah, and I, I have to add, I mean, I was working for DOD. I mean, we pretty much knew right away that it was a terrorist attack. Sure, that makes sense, sure. Deborah? It took me a while. I remember a friend saying that it was Bin Laden. And before that, I honestly don't remember hearing Bin Laden's name before. So it was just, I mean, I knew it was an attack when the second one hit, because what are the chances that, and then when we heard the Pentagon one was hit, um, and then the plane that went down in, in Pennsylvania. So it was at that point that I knew that we're under attack, but I didn't quite understand or realize who was behind it. Right. Right. I think it was, Eris, I think it was you that said, and this is what resonated with me. I took a walk over, um, and I've seen it prior, the, the exhibition that's up over in our gallery, um, where, it, again, I just, what ran through my head was, it, it was absolutely the worst of times, but it was also the best of times in so many ways. Um, and I think a number of you reflected on that and, and had that same, and you captured that, right, so really beautifully. 
Um, David has a question. I think panelists can see it, but I'll read it anyway. Um, how has your work, your photography since then that been impacted by what you saw at that time? The one thing that I've heard and that is definitely true is that well, I haven't been really, I haven't considered myself a true news photographer since I left the, new, the daily newspaper business in 1988. But you know you're a true photojournalist at heart when everybody else is running out and you're running in. So that's, um, even with COVID, you know, when I live in Manhattan and the streets were deserted last year, I went out. I went out at night. I went out during the day just to photograph the empty streets of New York. So everybody else ran away. And again, the photojournalists, I'm sure the other on the panel will say the same thing. We, we go in when everybody else is going out. I can only speak for myself, but um, I think with my work, um, I look for more empathy in my pictures. Um, six months after 9-11, I was in the Mideast in Israel covering suicide bombings. And uh, that type of work is very adrenaline pushing. It's, it can be addictive almost in that sense. But like I said, it's flipping a switch and the challenge is just flipping the switch back. And because of that, actually, my editor did not send me to Iraq or Afghanistan and maybe save my life because you don't know there could be a bombing. And then 10 minutes later, there could be another bombing. And sadly, I've lost uh, a couple of friends. Um, uh, but the, then just uh, locally, I've covered inner city violence in New Jersey and other places. And um, we, we photograph and then we're finished with our assignments. We send the pictures and we go home and we see our loved ones and we have a nice meal. But we have to remember that we documented people's lives, which maybe have changed forever. And you really had to be sensitive in uh, how you photograph, how do you approach people? Uh, because this is maybe one of the few times that you've ever really um, met uh, a, a journalist. So, um, you know, um, it, it's, I, I think definitely finding empathy uh, in people is really important. I think also, at least I know for myself and for Aris, because I'm friends with Aris, that we do what we do and we tune things off, but when then we get home and then when everything's done, I think that's when things start to seep in and we could crash. Um, I've been on an assignment to Haiti and to Peru and I just saw some of the worst situations that humans live through where there's no water, there's no food. They have to, the women have to walk eight hours just to get water. And at the time, I remember in Haiti at one point going behind this little house, it was more like a hut and just completely losing it and crying. I didn't want anybody to see me. So I tried to compose myself and it really was when I came home. Um, and still to this day, I mean, I was in Haiti in 2015 um, and even with 9-11, there's certain times where I'll see things on TV and I just break down crying. I see other people's pictures and I just break down crying and we have to tune that off. We have to shut it down. Um, I also covered uh, Haiti after the earthquake and that was actually one of the hardest things. I've never seen living conditions like that ever. Um, we had to put toothpaste underneath our nose because the rotting stench of the bodies was so bad. And uh, just the living conditions were so poor. And uh, let's face it, when we come, uh, we live at home and we, we want nice things. And uh, I want a good cell phone connection. And I distinctively remember right after I got back from Haiti, uh, I was out with some friends uh, at a bar. And uh, this person was complaining that, she got bad cell phone connection. And I'm just thinking, 
you know, I, I do like a good connection. I mean, these little things in our lives, but then this is such a first world problem and we need to be just appreciative of clean running water and all these little things. And um, in the bigger scope of things, I think you had to put perspective. And I think that's the one thing which I've really learned through my work. Yeah, I would like to touch on that too. For me, the camera becomes like a barrier between, you know, what's real and, and, and what's not. And as long as I have that camera in my hands and I'm looking through it, it separates me from what's real and I can hide behind that camera and we can photograph some of the most horrid, wretched things you could ever imagine, you know, within DOD. But if I have that camera, I don't, I'm not even there. I'm inside that camera. I'm part of its mechanism. You know, I'm worried about my, you know, my composition, you know, am I shooting it correctly? And, 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 you know, you need that, you need that barrier. You need something to, to, distance yourself from the wretchedness of it and for me i mean 9 11 was a tip on the iceberg but in previous years that we had covered you know kosovo and and all kinds of you know awful things that was going on within you know dod and i was able to craft that and, and just use that camera as that that barrier that wall because it would affect me psychologically I mean, not that 9-11 did it. I mean, most of us probably all had PTSD from that event. But as long as I had that camera, I can, I can shoot anything. So that's my two cents. Well, I would uh, add to Gary, taking the pictures is the easy part. And you use your training and you become hyper-focused because we know what makes a good picture and we have the technical skills. The problem is, is when you put the camera down and try to make that switch come back to reality. Right. And so being at a bar and seeing a person freak out about her cell phone connection, you're like, wow. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate everything that you brought to us this evening. Um, on behalf of myself, our alumni, our college, our dean, our guest here this evening, my co-host, William Snyder, um, thank you, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank, wow. you. thank, thank you. Thank you for having me.